Hello viewers. We just hit 5,000 subscribers on the channel. And in honor of everybody who's been watching, participating in the comments, and just overall participating in the channel, I want to say thank you. I want to say thank you to everybody who subscribed and commented and made this experience a delightful one. Uh, it's been a long road, and I know I haven't been very active here. And I want to say first and foremost, uh, I kind of apologize to anybody who's expected more frequent uploading on the channel. And full disclosure, I don't expect that to really change much in the future, so I expect it to be continuously sporadic and uh, infrequent that I upload. I just... I guess I don't have the inclination to make as many videos as some other channels do. I'm happy, you know, not being a super massively popular or active YouTuber. Uh, I'm more than happy having a small channel that isn't particularly well known or present. You know, the numbers don't really matter to me. What matters is the uh, quality of the engagement and the content and the discussions that we have. And I think for what it's worth, I wouldn't change a damn thing. The experience I've had with YouTube and the people who watch and comment here has been very pleasant and very engaging, and I'm very grateful to have had the experience that I have. But that being said, today's video will be revisiting a, uh, a video that I did a long time ago. I think it was actually the first video that really kickstarted the engagement that my channel had and that was a video covering how through on burst works as you can see here is a uh, m16 this would be an m16a4 with the uh, detachable carry handle and in the fire control group we have the safe semi burst configuration so we do have through on burst and you see there as I'm sure you've noticed a couple times already if I only fire a couple of rounds and then uh, hit it again, it's almost like it goes, it completes the, one of those three rounds or two of those three rounds. So there's like an inherent memory there and I'll explain what's going on there and why that is. The M16 or the M4 will do that. Any of the M16 or AR platform rifles that have a fire control group with three round burst available will do this. Other firearms may not do this, and I'll again explain the reason why that is later. But uh, with that being said, I think it's appropriate that we can go ahead and start diving into the mechanisms behind how this works. Longtime subscribers to the channel may immediately recognize this scene that we have in front of us. Although there have been a few differences made to this demonstration since it was last demonstrated. As you can see, I can actually manually cycle the bolt. As well, light strikes can be presented to you. What that means, if you're unaware, is the hammer can be in the down position, as in it's touching the firing pin, but a round hasn't been discharged. And that's an important thing to demonstrate for reasons I'll go over later. But uh, just to start, we're going to cover the semi-automatic fire control setting. As you can see here, we'll start with the simple. You have your trigger and you have your hammer. We'll ignore this red piece for now. So the trigger and the hammer operate in such a manner that the trigger holds the hammer in place. So when you're not pressing the trigger, the hammer is going to stay cocked. When you press the trigger, it moves out of the way of the hammer and lets it go. That causes it to fire. What the selector does, and the selector is a very simple piece of material, it's uh, literally just a drum of metal. And on part of the drum, you cut out a section that makes room for the trigger to move. So think of it this way. You just have like a cylinder of metal that sits from, through the receiver from one side to the other. And it being held in place by the receiver 
makes a very sturdy barrier for anything mechanical to act against. So if it interfaces with it and there's no room provisioned for that piece to move, it's not going to move. In the case of a safety, that literally pre prevents the trigger from being pressed at all, which maintains positive engagement with the hammer. There's no way that you could ever manipulate a safed rifle like this in a way that isn't destructive that would cause it to fire. So for all intents and purposes, safe on an M16 or M4, or in this case, the pieces resemble an AR-15 because you have the shapes of like the hammer, the trigger, the disconnector, which is this piece in red. Those are all AR-15 pieces and those can only fire in semi-auto. So what that means when people say semi-automatic is that you press the trigger once and it will only ever fire once. So I'm holding pressure on this trigger and the hammer remains cocked now. That disconnector is doing the job similar to the trigger. So there's another interface surface on the hammer up here that touches and is held by the disconnector. And so I'll go over a couple, couple terms that you may be unfamiliar with and those are positive interfacing and negative inter interfacing. There's also a term called neutral interfacing and I'll go over what all of these mean. So between the hammer and the trigger right now, we have what is called a positive interface. And what that means is that the shape and the angle of these surfaces right here encourage these pieces to slip into each other rather than if it were negative interfacing, they would want to push each other away just by being in contact. So like pressing on the hammer like this would, if these were negatively interfaced, push these apart. We have an example of a negative interface here, and that is between the disconnector and the hammer. Although it is not in the position you saw earlier where it was being caught, but rather when you've pressed the trigger while the hammer is being cocked by the bolt, you get a negative interface right there. And there's a spring inside here, inside the trigger that pushes the back end of the disconnector up. And it sits on the same hinge pin that the trigger does, so they share an axis. What that means, like you saw there, is that the disconnector can be pushed out of the way by the hammer. Again, that negative interface. And it transitions right there to a positive interface, meaning it's one that tends to want to stay together. So like if there were no spring pressure on the trigger right here, these would want to stay together like that. But it's the pressure of the return spring on the trigger, which isn't illustrated here for simplicity, just so it's not, you know, obfuscated with all these springs and spring arms and pieces we don't really need to see to know what's going on. That spring pressure is what drives these apart. And these are tuned so that by the time the disconnector, which interfaces again with the trigger here on a solid surface, meaning it won't collapse into that. When the trigger is released, they're tuned so that by the time the trigger, or sorry, the disconnector lets go of the, tr of the hammer, the trigger is already in position to catch the hammer again. So there's no risk of another discharge on release. There are triggers that are designed specifically to accomplish that, and they're known as binary triggers. You may have heard of them before, and uh, they're tuned specifically to cause that reliably. If this were tuned just to not catch the hammer at all over here, that wouldn't be a safe condition. There would be a position between the uh, disconnector releasing the hammer and the uh, trigger actually catching the hammer, that would just be a no interface zone and you could potentially just have the hammer free to move however it will. And that's not a good thing. You want something to be there to catch the hammer one way or another. So having covered semi-automatic, we can move on to full auto. Another thing I wanted to add really quick in regards to positive and negative interfacing is that I said before that 
this interface right here is a positive one, meaning that they tend together, but only just positive. Like it is ever so barely positive. This would rather and more appropriately be called a neutral interface, meaning that if there were no torques being applied to either the, uh, or sorry, just the trigger. So like if I got rid of the spring that acted on the trigger, forcing it forward, these two pieces would hold each other in place, but only just, meaning that if I were to push forward on the back of the trigger here, causing the disconnector to inch backward, it would do so and keep its position very likely. So like there would be just enough friction between the hammer and the disconnector that if I backed the trigger up a little bit, it would continue to maintain the slack that I had taken up. So that's, that's what we mean by a neutral interface. Things are being pressed together mechanically, but their position relative to each other, so like the angles that they have on their respective axes, doesn't tend to change. Whereas with a positive engagement, they want to mesh together more tightly and tend towards their most bound state. For example, like the hammer and the trigger. So like this hammer doesn't want to stay in a more cocked position. It wants to drop to its lowest energy state available. And the same goes for the trigger, which under its spring pressure wants to tend upwards into the hammer. But regardless of that, if I were to remove the spring on the trigger again, right here, the angles between them would want to push the trigger up anyways. So if I can actually find, here it is. So if I remove that, right now the trigger is basically dead. There's nothing that really wants to make it fall down other than gravity. So if I shut gravity off, there is nothing to rotate it back other than, you know, little mechanical engagements that you get here and there. But I'll show you, I'll try to catch it kind of midway up if I can, which is harder to do than it looks like. So if I catch it like right there, you saw it just wants to push it in, regardless of how I try to approach it. It wants to come up, but back to what I was saying with the disconnector, ooh, Actually, I think those might be negatively inter interfaced. So like normally, hold on, if I let the hammer go. So there's no torque wanting to pull this forward. And if I just, oh shit, those are negatively interfaced, aren't they? Okay, so I misspoke. I actually lied to you. So these two inter interfacing surfaces actually mesh negatively. So in other words, if you're not pressing the trigger, the disconnector itself wants to push the trigger forward just because the hammer's pushing against it. Okay, I'm happy I clarified that. Yay for transitions that aren't jarring to the viewer. Yes, I've seen some of your comments. I promise that I'll work on my camera work and not give you Wayne's World extreme close up. Although I kind of gotta be honest and it feels good to see the haters get all pent up sometimes. Okay, I promise I'm gonna stop doing that as much as I can from now on. And full disclosure, having looked back at some of my older videos, I can admit they can be a little bit difficult to watch sometimes. So I do promise going forward, if I do any camera work in Algadu, I'm gonna try to do smooth panning, smooth zooming, and make it easy on the eyes to watch. Or I can just transition smoothly between scenes, kind of like this, and it would make things a lot easier to watch if I'm not constantly zooming and jumping around the scene. Wait, we weren't talking about helicopters, were we? No, that's, that's for a different video. I apologize. Let's go back to the subject matter at hand. So you see a lot of the same parts here that you saw before. Notice things have slightly different shapes. So the trigger here 
I, I gave some artistic liberty to represent things in two dimensional. At the back of the trigger here on an AR-15 trigger, this section is closed. So what I mean by closed is if you were to look into the back of this trigger, it's like rotate this front section so it's facing away from you and you're staring down the back of this, there would be a wall here, a wall of metal or material that the trigger is made out of. On the M16 or the M4 full auto or three run burst triggers, that's open. And that's so that the disconnector can stick back further and interface with the selector. And I'll explain what's going on there in just a second. So you have the same thing going on here. So if you set your selector to semi-automatic, you're still going to get the same functioning where the disconnector will catch the hammer once it's fired. Letting go causes the hammer to snap back onto the trigger and the process repeats. What happens with the selector, you notice there's a red piece here, that actually interfaces with this. And like I said before, that important distinction that this is very rigid, the material of the selector is very rigid and held very securely in the receiver, that's important. So in this position, you have a cutout that blocks the trigger, right? This is familiar. But if you rotate further, you have a section of this which on the M6 or sorry, the AR15 selector would be solid enough to prevent the trigger from moving here. That's been cut down by another machining pass on either side so that this red section here of this like hemispherical or hemicircular cutout of the selector drum is thinner than the cutouts in the trigger. So like the trigger has this sort of shape if you look down it from the rear. You have a cutout right here. And what the selector is doing right now is just fitting into that. So the trigger can move up into it like that and it's free to move. But the disconnector, which sits inside the trigger like this, let me align things a little bit better, cannot move up. So it gets blocked by the selector. On the safety, when you throw it into safe, goodness, let me just move these out of the way like this. When you throw this in a safe, you have a part of the selector now that's just, okay, blocking the trigger like this, so it can't move up. You know this. But here, this section is just thin enough that it slides inside the trigger, or rather the trigger slides up around it. So now, this section blocks the connector or d the disconnector which is under spring pressure so it's not rigidly coupled to the trigger so the trigger can still move even though the disconnector is blocked and what ends up happening is you have a trigger now that lets go of the hammer hammer goes forward it fires it's gonna cock what's gonna keep the hammer back when the bolt goes forward this blue piece right here. That's your auto sear. These were traditionally safety devices and these were intended to keep the hammer cocked regardless if whether you were pressing the trigger so that it would not fire until the bolt was closed. The reason this is important and you can't just get away without the auto sear. We had one light strike that did go off there, but if you notice what happened, the hammer went forward and just kind of rode the bolt home. And what that ends up doing is not delivering enough energy to the firing pin to actually set off around. So if you didn't have an auto sear and your disconnector wasn't catching your hammer, 
and you intended to fire full auto, it wouldn't work. You might get off a round or two, and the ATF has exploited this before in making cases in criminal prosecution against people who had supposed machine guns. They used very soft primer ammo that would be set off by these kind of light strikes, but it's, it's foul play. And I can cover that more in depth in a different video. But uh, generally, most ammo isn't going to be sensitive enough that it would be set off by this condition. You need the auto sear, whoop, you need the auto sear to actually hold the hammer long enough that it delivers its full energy only when the bolt is fully sent home. So we'll review. Safety blocks the trigger entirely. Can't move out of the way of the hammer, hammer can't fall. Can't shoot. Semi-automatic, cutouts provided for the trigger and the disconnector to move. So they can move out of the way of the hammer, allowing it to fall. Firing around, cycling the action, causing the hammer to be cocked and caught by the disconnector. Full auto, that same cutout that was previously provided for the trigger is still provided for the trigger, but another piece of metal has been moved into position to block the disconnector. So it no longer can move to catch the hammer. Additionally, a portion of the selector that previously blocked the disconnector is now moved out of the way in the, or sorry, the auto sear is moved out of the way and now it can move and actually engage with the hammer. And its function is to hold the hammer in the cocked position until the bolt closes. And the reason this cutout's important, the reason you want the auto sear to actually be blocked, this is actually kind of strange. A lot of firearms don't block the auto sear at all. For example, an AK-47, the auto sear is always going, whether it's on safe, semi, or full auto. The auto sear will always hold the hammer in the cock position, regardless of your fire selection, until the bolt closes. And the reason it can get away with that is because the way an AK is assembled, the auto sear doesn't get in the way of anything. But on an AR-15 or an M16, you'll notice, if I can find it, I'll find a good example. Another piece of software that viewers of the channel might recognize. When you disassemble an M4 or an AR-15, you have to clamshell the upper receiver down onto the lower receiver with the bolt inside it. And if you were paying attention, the back section of the bolt here actually uses the auto sear or actually touches the auto sear to trip it. And so if the auto sear is in the open position, as in it's ready to catch the hammer, you're going to press down on top of it when you go to clamshell this thing down. So what the selector does is allow you the option to throw it on safe. And when you do so, the auto sear is moved out of the way and you can actually close it. So if it were like this, you notice the auto sear is rotated back. The bolt would come down on top of this. So by throwing it on safe, it's moved out of the way and the bolt will come in behind it. I'll move all these components to the rear so that you can see this happen. Let me increase my drag tool strength. Boom, just like that. I mean, it's not exactly perfect because it's Al Gadoo and I, this is old, this is like 10 years old now. But it demonstrates the principle. So we'll do that again, but we'll throw it on the full auto and you'll see 
the bot kind of, well, you see, there you go. You kind of see it had to come down on top of it and it accommodated in this example, but in, in the real world, it presents a physical barrier to actually closing it. I actually have a replica M4A1 that I can probably get some video of to demonstrate this with. So I'll do that and I'll segment that in so that you can see it. Oh Jesus, it's heavy. It actually did it. I don't, mm, actually, there's a little bit of a gap. Watch as I throw this into semi. Boom. So separate those again. So I'm putting a little bit of pressure on there. That auto sear keeps those. So that's what that, that's what that's for. And yes, of course, this is not real. This is. But don't go pointing it at any cops. Okay, having covered that tangent about needing the auto sear to be pushed out of the way for the bolt to actually have room to come down when assembling the AR. Uh, now we can cover through round burst because I think we understand full auto effectively now. It's basically like a disconnector that's operated by the bolt. The trigger has no influence on it. So you notice a few differences here as well. The selector is the exact same. The auto sear is the exact same. For better or worse, the hammer is the exact same, although there are differences on a through round burst hammer that I'll sort of go over in a minute. You also have a different disconnector. If you notice here as well, there's this sort of rounded and extended section of the trigger. There's two disconnectors in here. There's, you can kind of see the red one in the back and it has its tail to be blocked by the selector as well. This one's cut out of the way, kind of like the AR-15 disconnector. But you notice here it has another hook type extension on it and there's this little wheel so this wheel is what they call a burst cam and its job is to interface with this disconnector and regulate when it does and does not engage with the hammer so its job is to actually prevent this disconnector from engaging with the hammer until it is counted out three shots and so i'll demonstrate before i properly explain it fires three times and then stops. And then like any engagement with the disconnector, the disconnector holds it until the trigger is released. Functions exactly the same as the other. You also have semi-auto here as well. And you can see it there engaging that disconnector that's at the rear. So what we've done here is we've made these disconnectors about half as thick as the single disconnector would be on a just full auto or a just semi-auto trigger group so that they can sit side by side inside the trigger. So using that similar example to before where we have this kind of box with a cutout to represent the trigger, we're now doing instead of this for your disconnector, you're doing this. So you have two independent disconnectors. However, like I said before, there was kind of a, uh, a spring springing up the disconnector. So if you imagine you set it to three round burst, which is in the same selector position that full auto would be, you've blocked one of your disconnectors, right? If these share the same spring, the blocked disconnector will prevent the free or unrestricted disconnector from actually getting any spring pressure. So the reason for this segment right here 
is it's more like a cutout that's been made in the trigger to allow more room for another spring. So we'll duplicate this like so. And if you just imagine for a minute, like we've, we've cut out this wall right here in the section that this occupies. So we've made room for these springs. So now you can see they sit here, they push up on the individual disconnectors and life is good. Things operate as they are intended to again. So now that we've covered that, let me go into more detail about what's going on here between this disconnector and this wheel that makes it operate this way. So on the side of the trigger, you have a spring. So I'll actually go back to the full auto one. There's a raised section of the hammer right here. And on the three round burst trigger pack, there's a spring that sits around this. And if you've ever played with a pen and you've disassembled it and taken the spring that winds around the ink core, you'll notice that you can freely spin it one way but it binds against it going the other way. And this principle is exploited here. So the spring that winds around the hammer has a leg that goes through the hammer. So there's actually a hole cut into it to accept that arm. So for better or worse, the, uh, oh, sorry, it isn't the hammer, it's the wheel. This wheel has a hole cut in it that accepts that spring. And it sits, there's a cutout inside it that sits around this drum and so the spring will freely glide around this drum going one way but it'll tighten and uh, catch on the drum going the other way and so what happens is you have a hammer that can fall freely but when it gets cocked that spring binds up and drags that cam with it. And you notice with the cam wheel, there's six little notches cut into it. Two of them are deep and four of them are shallow. And so these shallow notches allow the disconnector to be held back far enough that it can't engage with the hammer like you see here. And on return, you notice that the uh, disconnector or sorry, the cam kind of wants to rotate forward with the hammer. It, it's so that spring isn't perfect and there's still a little bit of friction pulling it forward. So that hook kind of does two jobs. And you notice I was talking about positive, negative and neutral engagement surfaces there. There's a, a slightly positive engagement there between the teeth on the wheel and the disconnector. And so that'll prevent it from following the hammer forward the rest of the way. So then it'll fall forward, hit the firing pin, fire, and it'll get cocked again as the weapon cycles, and it'll drag the next notch into engagement with the disconnector. Now it's still a shallow notch, so that disconnector can't grab the hammer yet. It still has to go through the motions one more time, snag the wheel one more time, if I can get it to do it. See, I don't actually use a spring because springs are finicky and all I could do. I actually have a ratcheting mechanism, but it kind of has to fire for that to work. So I have to assist it forward. And after it fires a third time, that hook follows into a deeper notch and the disconnector can catch the hammer. And that's how you get through on burst. Of course, the auto sear still does its still does its thing it's still necessary to uh obviously hold the hammer for those three shots that are uh that's actually two shots that are full auto like right the first one is off the trigger the subsequent two shots will be off the auto sear and then the disconnector will catch it hopefully this explained things with a little bit more visual pleasantness like it wasn't as jarring to watch as the original was maybe it answered a few more questions oh speaking of answering questions
there's a couple of questions that people might have about this mechanism that I just thought of. So one is, do all mechanisms use this kind of wheel arrangement? And the answer is no. And I actually have videos on a few of these that use kind of a spring-loaded mechanism that does something else. And when you let go of the trigger, it snaps back to where it was. Those are more appropriate to cover in those videos. And I encourage you to go look at those videos on this channel to fit, to learn more about them. But no, this wheel is not universal. Some firearms that are not M16s or M4s do use these, but they're not that common because they're not ideal. And one of the reasons they're not ideal is I'm sure you've already picked up on already is they can do that. They have kind of a memory because they're not spring loaded to return to a zero state is you can fire two rounds and they don't even have to be in three round bursts. You can fire in semi-auto and that wheel's still gonna wander because while well, the spring and the cam do their thing every time the hammer drops. So you can fire two rounds from a zero to cam, switch to three round bursts and you only get one round. Another question that people might have is, does this affect the trigger pull of the weapon? And the answer is yes. So like, for example, here, there's no restriction on that three round burst disconnector. You only have the restriction on the semi-auto disconnector. So that's consistent between all the trigger pulls. So whether you're on a zero, one, two, or a three, you uh, don't get any changing resistance from the red disconnector there. But you'll notice that right here in this position, that three round burst disconnector actually has freedom to move. So right now it doesn't provide any resistance, but as soon as I fire that first shot, suddenly it acts like it's being held by a selector. So it's restricted and I feel the spring pressure through the trigger for these next two shots. And this subsequently translates to semi-auto. So if you're firing a three round burst M16 or M4 in semi-auto, you will get one light trigger press and two slightly heavier trigger presses. If I print the force, you might actually see the numbers. So I'll try to grab it as close to the tip as possible. So about 43,000 Newtons. Or 4,300. You notice here 4,400. 4,000. Yep, about 400 extra Newtons in this little example. Which, those aren't real world numbers. If you notice, like, this bolt is over a meter long. That's not real world scale, right? These things are sized up just to make them more reliable and trustworthy when it comes to the uh, visuals and their reliability. But these slight differences are noticeable to experienced shooters, and that can be a negative in regards to the M16 or the M4 in terms of how they handle as marksman weapons because you do have a difference in the way the trigger feels between trigger pulls and that's not ideal so when we're talking about different kinds of burst mechanisms one that resets is ideal in this circumstance because you have a consistent trigger pull because the thing always resets to zero anyway i think that clears up most of the questions that i can think of that i haven't already talked about or covered in some other way uh, I'm sure people are probably going to ask more. People are going to have other questions as well. And, uh, well, that's what the comment section is for. No video is perfect. I can't expect to cover absolutely everything that anybody's going to ask. So hopefully this was sufficient for its purposes.
again, I want to thank you guys for helping me reach 5,000 subscribers. I think that was overnight today. It's uh, November 4th now, 2023. And I want to say I checked yesterday or the day before. And we were just shy of 5,000. And the subscribers have been consistently coming in. People have been uh, consistently subscribing slowly but surely. And, well, we reached a milestone. 5,000 is a good number. And I figured it was appropriate to, you know, honor that somehow. Thanks for watching. I hope you guys have a good one. Obligatory. Full auto. Drum mag dump. Because freedom. I think Democrats just want to see these banned because they're black.